Well hi again everyone, welcome back to another video and today's video it's a Friday video tidying up everything in the week that you've asked questions about from the videos that I've actually posted this week. So um, we started off with the uh, bunker lesson and then we've done the 13th hole and the 14th hole as well. So. Um, we'll go back to Friday, uh, the week before, where we did draws and fades and had some questions about that. So I'm going to tie those in as well with what we're going to do now. So I'll rattle through a couple of questions and this is not going to be me sitting here. I'm actually going to get out on the garden and I'm going to show you some stuff today as well. So um, the first question and the reason why we're actually sat here is because the first question has been... Uh, a number of questions that I've had regarding me using my laser all the time. So I think historically you've always seen people pointing their laser for their second shots uh, at the green, laser in the top of the flag. We have special flags at Tandridge that pick up the laser beams and deflect them and send those signals back telling you how far it is to the flag. But there's so much more to a laser than uh, obviously just that. And you've seen this week how I use it quite cleverly on the course. I know exactly how far it is to carry certain things. I know exactly how far it is to get to certain things. So lots of you carry GPS and that's fantastic. In this modern world of golf, we have devices which can help us along. And it's really, really, you know, up to you to practice with them and to understand exactly what you're doing. So the question regarding the laser, is it for me, you know, should I be getting a laser rather than the watch I use at the moment? Well, they really are two very, very different things. Um, unless you have a watch which can give you more information like layup yardages and all the rest of it. I find a laser much easier to use, but I do use the GPS on my electric trolley as well. I find that really, really useful, front, middle and back. Um, but I'd be lost without my laser. And you can see how quickly that I use my laser when I'm actually playing a hole so I can discover how far it is to a certain spot, how far it is to carry this spot, how far it is to not get myself into that bunker or reach that danger. And I can make my decisions much more decisively clearer picture of what I'm trying to do then I can go into my bag I can pick a club which I know is going to do the job properly and I can have confidence in that to make a good swing so that's why I use a laser you'll see beside me here um, because I've been getting some deliveries uh, to home um, that um, this is our new Bushnell stand for this year and it comes complete with uh, as you can see there, five different varieties of laser. And for the first time this year, Bushnell have introduced a laser under £200. So um, this one here, uh, which is now called T to Green, it's a new laser. It's actually brought to the market by Tasco, but it's made by Bushnell. It comes out of the same factory. And that's why we're very, very happy to have it in the range as an entry level um, yardage reader. Um, and the reason it's not in the uh, case at the moment is that just before lockdown it was sold. So um, that's why it's not there. We've not been able to get any others um, because we're not ordering stuff. But here they all are. Tor V5, that's the laser I use. Um, and it's the sort of probably going to be the most popular of those then you have the tall v5 shift and the shift has a little button on the side that you switch from side to side and um, you can practice with it in shift mode but you can't play with it in shift mode and what shift does is it actually works out gradient for you as well so if you're practicing on the course on your own and let's say, for instance, you're playing hole four. It wouldn't give you the yardage lasered to the flag. It would give you a, um, a yardage worked out over that gradient. So for the upslope, the laser works out how many yards extra that particular shot is playing 
and it will give you that yardage so it's an absolute dream if you're out on the course practicing on your own um, and you can put it in shift mode so that when you come to playing club competitions you'll actually know exactly how much further you should be clubbing for for the uphills but it also works out the downhills as well and that can be very important at the club also so uh, the top one there um, uh, the sorry the next one up is the hybrid and the hybrid has it has GPS on the side front middle and back yardages any course 35,000 courses preloaded but it also has a laser and when you press the button on the screen not only does it give you the laser distance but it also gives you front middle and back inside the screen so that is a really really nice piece of kit uh, so it basically it does the job of my electric trolley and my laser at the same time top one there has fantastic graphics it's the top of the range xe it's waterproof um, it has superb graphics it's accurate to to less than 0.1 of a meter uh, so it's the real real uh, top draw it's called the xe um, and these are the only lasers that i'll sell in the shop and the reason why is because they're just that good um, and i've tried nikon ones and th other things like this and they're, they're just nowhere near as good so um Bushnell have come up with a home delivery service at the moment so if you're thinking about getting a laser um, then you can actually shop if you want to and I'm not sure anyone does want to do any shopping at the moment and I wouldn't blame them for that um, but Bushnell will um, we can order your laser for you and it can be shipped direct to your home so it doesn't have to go to the shop or anything like that it can actually be um, sent directly to your home so if you want to speak to me about that then email me um, and um, I can let you know um, the costs etc of, of these new items but all new range for Bushnell for this year that's why I use it I hope I've answered that question for those people that are, are asking me about it it's not just for laser and the pin I do lots and lots of different jobs with it so um, the other questions that I've had, which we're going to come to on the um, on the mat, draws and fades. Well, people said to me, draws and fades in my dreams. What am I going to do with this information? Well, what you should be doing with that information is you should be using it to help your game in the state that it is at the moment. So if you slice the ball, work out from the draw setup how you can possibly aim better and hit the ball straighter or if you hook the ball too much you can use it vice versa so there is information to be taken from there and then once you know and understand what actually creates the shapes you can work on that you know from that there so i'm not going to get into that one on the mat but that's the answer to that question you know it's not in your dreams take away the information and understand what the differences are so draw we're making a flatter swing fade we're making a steeper swing cross the ball etc etc and you can learn so much from that um relevant question regarding the bunkers someone asked me about bunkers of sand that's very deep and sand that's uh, hard and compact after rain what would we do in those situations so that's something I missed in the bunker masterclass there because obviously the video was long as it was but I'll show you that now when we go out onto the garden uh, I'll show you exactly what goes on with that uh, with that question there um, ball flights now there's one that's uh, caught the attention ball flights I've had a couple of people asking about ball flights good players and other players how do I hit it lower how do I hit it higher and how does wind affect the ball downwind against wind so I'm going to show you that out on the mat as well I have a question in from Rosie Carter Wallstock hi Rosie hope you're okay and I know you're enjoying the videos and thanks very much for your emails left arm straight at the top of the backswing is it a rule what are the guidelines on that I'm going to show you that out on the mat as well we'll go through that and um that's going to be it for this Friday, so it's going to be a lot of information, but a lot of good stuff for you to take in. Some really, really interesting points that might help you to actually play hole 14 in particular 
a lot better than you do at the moment. Let's get out on the garden. Let's have some fun out there. Okay, so out on the mat, here we are answering the questions and they're all relevant to the videos that I've sent out in the last four or five days. So the first one was from Roderick Bain Jardine and it was about the bunkers. And what happens when we get faced with situations where the consistency of the sand from one bunker to another, let's say, is either deep sand or it's rained and it's rock hard and there's absolutely nothing under the ball at all. Well, clearly you've got to have a completely different process when that happens and you walk into the bunker and once you wriggle your feet down, as we spoke about in the video, you'll know, hopefully, what the consistency of that particular bunker is and how you're going to play the shot. So remember now, if you watch the video and we talked about bounce angles, these are the critical factors regarding how you're going to use those clubs. So in deep sand, deep sand, I'll always go for my 58 degree wedge, which carries a bounce angle of 12 degrees. So it has a considerable amount of bounce when you think that my lob wedge has five or even four. So you can get zero degree bounce lob wedges. So lob wedges have no bounce at all. So if we've had a look at the way that they sit and we rest this club down, you can see how it sits there. Look how the leading edge sits above my hand. So remember, on tight ground or on a hard-packed bunker, this particular approach where the leading edge is sitting off the ground so much, because there's a lot of bounce on the club, that's not going to be good. So if you were chipping from hard pan, you'd now have to lean the handle forwards to take the bounce up at the back to get the leading edge closer to the ground. And that was a really, really important. But remember, when the sand is deep, this bounce helps you. And this bounce here, that's what keeps the club floating through the sand. And if it's deep sand, we're still gonna contact an inch behind, but you may need so much more speed to get the ball out a set distance. Now remember, if the sand is now hard packed, the club isn't going to travel into the sand at all. So the resistance that it provides is almost zero. So it's completely the opposite to using this here. So in a hard packed situation, what do I do now? Do I lean the handle forward with this club here and close it down? Well, possibly what I could do is I could change down to my 52 degree wedge or even my pitching wedge and I could use one of those. So let's have a look. Let's have a look with my pitching wedge. And if we have a look at the bounce angle now with my pitching wedge, you can see that the leading edge sits so much closer to the back of my hand there. So the handle doesn't need lead leaning forward so much. And that way I can use the club so it doesn't bounce off and me thin the ball all the time. Clearly, if the sand is thick and deep and it's resisting your club and you have to use more speed, when the sand is hard packed and you're using a club with a lot less bounce, you now need to swing so much slower because your contact is virtually on the ball. If you can now get closer to the ball with the contact of the sand, and I'm talking half an inch, so you're almost below that equator as the club arrives at the ball, contact it down and then out it'll come. But remember, the speed I would use for those two shots are so, so different. So using my 58 degree club for a bunker with deep sand, I'd open the face slightly there just, you know, because I like standing and using a little bit more loft. And now, and I've really created that splasher impact, high pace, really using full turn and cracking that sand with lots of speed. If I was using my pitching wedge to play the same shot now 
from a bunker that doesn't really have a great deal of sand in it or it's been raining and it's now really really solid now I've got to be really careful I'm going to use that club I can see that the leading edge is sitting so much closer to the ground and now I can play that shot in exactly the same way but with so much less speed remember there's no resistance so virtually everything that comes to the ball is almost like contact so we want to try and avoid too much pace in that way that's how you're going to differentiate which club to use the most important thing to take away from what i've talked about with bounce is to look at your wedges have a look at your wedges see what the bounce angles are if you have a low bounce option which should be a lob wedge realistically that's fantastic but in there you've also got to have a high bounce option and that could be your 56 or your 58 depending on what you use but we'd want one with high bounce so that we can use that in bunkers that have got plenty of sand in them that of course that you might visit or another where it's been raining and then you can use your lob wedge to play those bunker shots and those bunker shots are going to be played a lot less pace and the bounce is so small that you'll never get the leading edge bouncing up and thin in the ball so i hope that clears that up Roderick and um, you can get that into practice the next time you're playing on those different surfaces. Right, let's get on and now to the next question. Okay, so I'm gonna combine two questions in this one and hopefully we can get through this with a little bit of information regarding ball flight. Lawrence Plater, thanks for your question and Charlie Everest, thanks for your question on hole 14 in particular. How do we get that ball on that second shot driving up that hill? How do we control our ball flight? How do we understand the ball flight that we should be using and really trying to get that shot nailed on so when it lands, it chases up from that uh, left-hand side if you've left yourself a club that we know is going to go lower off the slope. So Lawrence's part of that question is about wind and how wind affects the shots that we play. Now, I was very, very fortunate as an assistant that I trained on a Lynx course, which was probably the best grounding that I could have had for being able to play shots of varying heights in different weather conditions. We know how incredibly wind affects the golf ball, downwind or against wind. The difference is vast how difficult and different the holes can play and it's about using that wind it's about understanding that wind and it's about trying to make sure that your ball is not affected by the wind too much so the first and most important thing about wind is that we mustn't use a swing that has high pace so if we use high pace all we do is generate more spin so that causes us massive, massive problems in terms of wind, because when the wind reacts with a golf ball that's traveling with high spin, it will just make it spin even more. So what we don't want is golf ball climbing up on, on, a, on a wind because it's spinning too much. So the idea is to take the spin off. We don't want much spin. So the way we do that is obviously by swinging slower so the first thing we would do is to make sure that we've taken lots and lots and lots more club we don't mind how high the ball goes unless you need to carry something in front of a green as long as it can get past that distance and carry that distance you're absolutely fine so i'm going to show you now just what would happen if i were trying to play a shot let's say from 100 yards it's normally my 52 degree wedge I would play that shot with, but I'm playing into a howling gale, and this is how I would approach it. So now is the question of where the ball needs to land. It's got to land 100 yards exactly, and I know it's really blowing hard into me. What should I do? So the first thing I'm gonna do now is to take a club, which I know will comfortably go the distance. So. My nine iron is 145 club, 150 at times. So I'm now gonna go to my nine iron because I've now got a club that will actually travel 45 yards further 
than the distance that I'm trying to hit this ball. Now, I could go to my eight iron, and for this example, I'm actually gonna do that because I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna slow my swing down even further. So we'll grab, we've grabbed an eight iron out of the bag, and let's get set up. So first and most important thing we do, we don't want a ball position which is now forward. And I'll show you why. So if the ball position is forward, my sternum is a set distance behind the golf ball. So that when my right hand goes to the underside of my grip, look what's happened to my sternum. Now that's the, that's the setup that we should be having with our driver. So that's the important part about having a driver setup. Balls forward, sternum leans to the right. So in this situation, because I want the ball to go lower, I've actually got the ball. So my normal eight iron ball position is about central and I'm gonna move it back to here and this is now closer to my right foot. So what I'm going to do now is to lean the handle forward. Now what I've done there is I have an 8 iron length shaft with probably a 6 iron loft. And that's the important part of this shot. Because now once I'm in that position, look at the lean. Now my sternum is now leaning to the left slightly and it's it, it's on the left hand side of the golf ball so that when I turn I stay more in front of the ball so that now as I come through you can see the shaft is leant forward and I'm driving the ball down okay let's have a look at that swing in slow motion and then we'll have a look and see how much lean there is in that setup and how much in front I am and you can see how I'm driving that ball down. Let's have a look. So there's the setup gone towards the back of the stance. You can see the lean. So now let's have a look in slow mo. Well, how about that? You can certainly see there how de-lofted that eight iron was and how far my hands were in front of the shaft as I came through, driving the ball forward. And that's how I'm gonna keep any club down. Remember on hole 14, hole 14, you're already on a down slope. So the slope is doing some of the work for you. So it's up to you now to make sure that you take a club that is not going to go too low because you have to get it airborne, fly the first bunker, uh, or if you're going to go left, it doesn't matter how low you go. But you know there there will be um, a shot that might go too low that won't do you any good at all. So remember, you're off a downslope. You could potentially be going in there from 220 yards. Now you've got a three wood in your hand. So what do you do with the three wood? Well, you do exactly the same as we've just done now. And all I would do is that instead of having my three wood off my left heel, I'm going to move my three wood forward. I'm going to stay over the ball and now I can drive it through. And the appearance of the club shaft would be exactly the same as it was with my eight iron here on the mat. Remember, if we've talked about hitting the ball lower, if we want to talk about hitting the ball higher, and that's what you should be trying to achieve when you're playing downwind, tee up the ball, get the ball position as far forward as you can and remember we've got the sternum now leaning to the right and now we're attacking the ball and driving it upwards and really making a good fist of getting that ball to go as far on the wind as we possibly can. Hope that answers that question for you Charlie and Lawrence and remember the biggest thing there is take enough club and swing as slowly as you can to get the job done. That's how you'll get less spin on the ball and that's how you'll make a success of that shot. Well, today's final part, final question is from Rosie Carter-Wolstock and Rosie's asking about 
left arm at the top of the swing does it need to be straight do we have problems over swinging is a modern swing which could be um, envisaged as quite a short swing is that popular is it what we should be doing so let's answer that question right now golf swings and certainly golf swings that I will teach you have to be in sync and when we say in sync let's just talk a little bit about that the body and arms have to be working together that is the most important thing if you do that correctly you'll get the club face back to square all the time and this is something within the lessons of the pupils that I teach we work on all the time because remember it's the torso that moves the arms it's the arms that get the club to the top and then it's the torso the body rotation that brings you back down to impact so you're in control of the club face if your hands and arms are doing the job of trying to get the club in the right position at impact you've got absolutely no chance of consistently hitting the ball straight so that's the first thing to consider left arm straight or not I've seen so many different versions, but if you look on tour, you'll see very few golfers who do not have what we would call a wide position at the top of their backswings. So let's have a look with the driver and let's have a look what we're talking about. So we set up at a dress and you can see that my left arm is now straight and I've got the entire length of the golf club plus the length of my left arm that is now a long club by holding down all we're doing is shortening the lever creating a narrower arc remember that so holding the club at the top an extended left arm fantastic the key to a great backswing is rotation if you don't rotate properly what will happen there is that your arms will find it very very difficult to continue so with this particular swing I'm going to show you exactly how that happens and what's going to happen now is I'm going to make a backswing where I don't turn my hips let's see what happens okay I'm stuck my hips have not moved, I'm completely stuck, my shoulders have turned as much as they want to in this position. So for me to get to the top now, I've got to create a little bit of hip turn and as you can see, the rest of my top half has now started to rotate again because the hips allowed so it's not just about turning the shoulders it's also about turning the hips so this will be in varying different degrees of difficulty for people you know if you're a bit like me where i'm a little bit tight and stiff and not very fit then you know you're going to be in a situation where you'll find it harder to turn so you've got to concentrate on turning your hips more if you turn your hips better you'll then turn your shoulders better as well and if that happens then your arms will get yourself into a great place. For the young athletes out there, they're trying to create a shoulder turn to 90 degrees, but creating not much rotation in the lower body at all. And that's how they create so much torsion. So we'll have a look at that now. Let's have a look and see where we can get the shoulders to by keeping the hips as static as possible. Now I've turned my shoulders to 90 degrees, but I've still had to get 20 to 25 degrees of rotation in my hips for me to actually do that I couldn't stay with my belt buckle facing the camera and get to 90 degrees I just couldn't do that so I had to let them go so remember this what did we say torso moves the arms arms are in control of the golf club and a backswing that's completed remember this it doesn't matter how short it looks as long as your shoulders are turned to 90 degrees. If you've turned your shoulders to 90 degrees, your backswing is completed and you should now be coming through with everything in sync as we mentioned at the start. So let's have a look at my backswing and let's have a look and see 
the connection between the shoulder rotation and the arms and the club. And watch how they go back together, then they stop together, then they come through together. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking for in your technique. We're set up, up to the top, and through. My rotation is in total control. I turn the arms back, I turn the arms through. But when my shoulders get to 90 degrees, my arms stop. Now, Rosie, if your arms are carrying on, we're now what we call out of sync. And because the arms are carrying on and the body rotation isn't, the left arm will start to buckle. Let's have a little look at this now. So I've continued the swing after the rotation had finished, arms carried on, have a look at the left arm, that's started to buckle. There's a very, very easy way for you to check to see if your swing is what we would call out of sync or too long. And all you need to do is to turn your shoulders to 90 degrees and my arms are going to be traveling away from me. Now, when my hands get to a position out here where they get to the top, you'll notice that they're traveling away from me to that maximum away position. If they start traveling back towards me, they've gone too far and I'm in trouble. I'm now out of sync. Let's have a look at that. So my arms have been traveling away from me. And although this is a short looking swing, I've completed a turn which has got everything to the top and it's in a great position. And that's where it would come down from. Let's have a look at the bad one, up to the top, traveling away, 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 away. Now have a look, now, now they've started coming back towards me. Now I'm in big trouble. So we can't allow that to happen because we lose the arc of our swing, create too much steepness in the downswing and that's not great. We've also lost the synchronicity between the club face and the body rotation. I'm going to show you my swing at full speed and we'll slow it down and we'll have a look at that. Let's have a look at that now. Okay, although you watch that in slow motion, I can tell you that was a really, really powerful swing and it would have sent the ball off at some great pace. Turned the shoulders to 90 degrees, but did you see the length of the backswing? Everything stopped at the same time, bang and all it came down together. And that's exactly how you're gonna hit the ball further, better club face position, and you're gonna hit it a lot straighter because you're in sync and that's the way we're going to really, really, really improve our golf. That's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Must apologise for getting my Welsh milk, milk bottle legs out. But I thought the sun was out and it's been a lovely day. I hope you've all had a great day. And I hope you've all enjoyed watching the videos this week. You won't see me now till Monday next week. Hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the sun. See you soon.